Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Updates on the Colorado shooting. The public honors the lives of the 10 victims and President Biden speaks on the horrific attack. The mayor of a small Arizona town says Border Patrol is sending illegal migrants to his town. The area is so overwhelmed that the mayor is declaring a state of emergency. Less than two weeks after Biden passed the virus relief bill, his administration now proposes another trillion dollar spending package. This one to fund infrastructure and other efforts Biden deems domestic priorities. And AstraZeneca faces delays in an attempt to roll out its vaccine in the U.S. Their study contained outdated info which didn't sit well with American drug regulators. That and more on NTD News. Ten lives were lost during the horrific shooting in Boulder, Colorado yesterday. Officials don't know the suspect's motive yet, but they released more information, including the names of the victims and the suspect. The suspect's arrest affidavit shows he purchased a semi-automatic rifle just six days before the shooting. NTD's Christina Kim has the latest. The ten victims were between 20 and 65 years old including police officer Eric Talley, who died while responding to the incident. They were killed during a shooting at a grocery store called King Supers in Table Mesa, just miles from Boulder, Colorado. Officials and locals are reeling from the shooting and mourning the deaths of the victims. I feel numb. Um, And it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to talk to victims, their families. Um, You know, it's tragic. One of the victim's daughters posted a tribute to her father, 61-year-old Kevin Mahoney. And people are honoring the victims by leaving flowers and messages at the site of the shooting. President Biden said the incident is devastating and is calling for gun reform. I don't need to wait another minute, let alone an hour, to take common sense steps that will save the lives in the future and to urge my colleagues in the House and Senate to act. We can ban assault weapons and high-capacity magazines in this country once again. The suspect was identified as 21-year-old Ahmad Alwi Alissa from Arvada, Colorado. Police say he spent most of his life in the United States. He's been charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. According to the affidavit, Alyssa had a rifle and a semi-automatic handgun. He had a gunshot wound in his thigh but is expected to be okay. He's being transferred to the Boulder County Jail after his hospital release. Officials say there is no official motive yet. His brother does not think the motivation was political. He believes it was from a mental illness. The suspect's 34-year-old brother told the Daily Beast that Alyssa is, quote, very antisocial, mentally ill, and paranoid. He noted his brother would often say he was being chased, that someone is behind him, or someone is looking for him. Alyssa's former classmate Dayton Marvel told the Denver Post that Alyssa was, quote, kind of scary to be around, was paranoid, and had a short temper. He remembers Alyssa yelled that he was going to kill everybody after losing a wrestling match. And Alyssa has a history of violence. In 2017, he attacked a classmate and was convicted of a misdemeanor assault in 2018. The White House ordered the flags to be lowered at half-staff to honor the 10 victims. Christina Kim, NTD News. Biden is considering taking executive action on gun control. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki says he's considering a range of ideas and executive orders are not off the table. And the Senate held a hearing today on reducing gun violence. Republicans and Democrats both agree prevention can stop mass shootings, but they disagree on how to go about it. The Senate Judiciary Committee held a hearing on gun violence Tuesday in the aftermath of two deadly mass shootings in a week. Both sides of the aisle agree they must take action to stop mass shootings. We won't solve this crisis with just prosecutions after funerals. We need prevention before shooting. The House earlier this month passed two bills to expand background checks, but face uphill battles in the evenly divided Senate. Democrats are pushing tighter gun control legislation, but Senator Ted Cruz says that's missing the mark. And every time there's a shooting, we play this ridiculous theater where this committee gets together and proposes a bunch of laws that would do nothing to stop these murders. 
Gun sales in the U.S. skyrocketed last year. Republican senators say the riots and looting made citizens want to protect themselves, and extended attacks on police could be a reason for increased gun violence. The solution is simple. We should support our police, we should enforce our laws, and we should, yes, lock up criminals. Other methods discussed in the hearing include banning assault rifles, red flag laws, and longer waiting periods for background checks. Lin Lin, NTD News, Washington, D.C. A small town in southern Arizona is pleading for help. The mayor says they cannot cope with the number of illegal migrants sent there by Border Patrol. NTD's Allison Lee has the details. The mayor of Gila Bend in Maricopa County, Arizona, says he is declaring a state of emergency over the migrant crisis in his town. And he is blaming the Biden administration for sending busloads of illegal immigrants there. In an interview with Fox Business, Mayor Chris Riggs says Border Patrol is sending migrants that have been detained for over three days in his town, but he doesn't understand the decision because they don't have anything to offer in Gila Bend. It only has a population of 2,000. He says, quote, We have no charity organizations that can help, no non-governmental organizations that a lot of the larger cities and towns do have to assist these people. The mayor says the town has not received any federal, state, or local funding to provide food, shelter, or virus tests to those migrants. The town has to resort to its own budget, but testing two busloads of migrants every week would cost around $600,000 a year, and that is over a third of the town's yearly budget. On top of the migrants dropped off by bus, the mayor also estimates that there are 20 illegal immigrants arriving on foot every day. He says the town faces not only a financial problem, but also an uptick in crime. Amid the surge in illegal border crossings, the Biden administration is building new facilities and converting convention centers to hold migrants. The San Diego Convention Center and the Kay Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center in Dallas, Texas, will both be converted. The number of unaccompanied minors apprehended by border agents jumped from nearly 6,000 in January to over 9,000 in February. Reporting by Ellison Lee, NTD News. And right on the heels of the virus relief bill, the Biden administration is already working on a new $3 trillion package on infrastructure and domestic needs. But some are asking how they plan to pay for it. NTD's Melina Wisecup has more details from D.C. The Biden administration now working with Congress on a new large spending bill to fund things like infrastructure, universal pre-K, free community college and paid family leave. The White House hasn't released any specific details or an estimated price tag for how much it could cost, but some news outlets are expecting the price to exceed $3 trillion. Democrats say they want a bipartisan bill, but some are aiming to push it through without any Republican support. We Democrats, all of us, believe we need big, bold change. Like the virus relief package, Democrats would have to use a budget process called reconciliation to get around the filibuster. Republicans are concerned this new spending proposal, along with the latest virus relief package, would be paid for through tax hikes. Is this being proposed, these tax increases, to offset the costs of the recently enacted partisan stimulus package, ma'am? No, the, the stimulus package, the um, American Rescue Plan, was not funded with any increases in taxes, but um, a longer-term plan uh, that addresses uh, critical needs really has in this economy probably would, would be accompanied by some re revenue raisers. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen saying changes to tax policy will help pay for the programs on infrastructure. Striving to produce legislation whose Washington tax grabs will have enormous harmful consequences for working families and Main Street businesses. He and other congressional Republicans were supposed to join a hearing in the House's chief tax writing committee, but he announced Republicans wouldn't join because he expected there would be no meaningful dialogue on crucial issues like infrastructure. Today's hearing is nothing more than another partisan exercise, so the Democrat House leadership can set up yet another multi-trillion dollar one-sided spending bill. 
And Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell says that when the bill is considered on the House and Senate floors, Democrats will likely say that it's to fund highways, but at the same time be packed with liberal policies such as funding for the Green New Deal. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weisscup, NTD News. Georgia is preparing to vote on a bill that could significantly change the voting landscape there. The state came under scrutiny during the 2020 presidential election for its voting systems. NTD's Steve Lance has that story and more. Thanks, Steph. Georgia's state lawmakers are seeking to clamp down on voter irregularities. The measures in their new bill would tighten restrictions and give state officials more power over local elections. Parts of the bill add identification requirements to absentee voting. Other parts would stop people from giving food and soft drinks to voters waiting in lines. Some opposing the bill say that it's an attempt to intimidate voters and that it would make voting more difficult for people. But backers of the bill say they are increasing voting opportunities by requiring two Saturday early voting days, where under current law only one is required. The measure could reach the Georgia House floor as soon as Thursday. And in South Dakota, House Bill 1217 was passed by the state legislature. However, Governor Kristi Noem refused to sign the bill. Last night on the Tucker Carlson Show, the South Dakota governor made an appearance where she got into a debate with Tucker over the reasons for sending the bill back for revisions. The legislation was designed to protect female athletes from competing in sports with biological men. However, the Republican governor said that legal advisors warned her that the bill is, quote, a trial lawyer's dream. Tucker accused her of kowtowing to the NCAA and big business. And Vice President Kamala Harris was in Jacksonville, Florida, where she laughed off a question when asked if she planned to visit the border. Both Democrats and Republicans are showing concern for the situation on the border, as the issue appears to be getting worse. Photos were released showing large groups of unaccompanied minors packed in tight, body to body, in holding facilities. When asked if she would visit the border, Harris went on to say, quote, I have before and I'm sure I will do it again. At this point, it is unclear whether Harris will make a visit to the U.S.-Mexico border. Steph? And just yesterday, doctors praised the latest results of a U.S. study on the AstraZeneca vaccine. But it turns out the company may have released some outdated and potentially misleading information. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more on that. In Europe, AstraZeneca was already under pressure when almost 40 people reportedly developed blood clots after getting their vaccine. Now the companies admitted to using outdated numbers in their recent study and that they'll put out new results within 48 hours. Dr. Fauci told ABC it was an unforced error, the data was good, and propped up the vaccine. This is very likely a very good vaccine. And this kind of thing does, as you say, do nothing but really cast some doubt uh, about the vaccines and maybe contribute to the hesitancy. Over 128 million people have been vaccinated, but before they're administered, they're delivered. And on Monday, a delivery team was held at gunpoint. The Texas Idaho Police Department says Larry Harris stopped a van of National Guard soldiers, held them at gunpoint, and demanded that he search their van, posing as a detective. Harris was arrested and faces multiple charges. He said he thought the guards kidnapped a woman and child, but police, the police chief says Harris appeared to be mentally disturbed. Homeland Security is investigating the issue, and the suspect is expected to be hit with federal charges. No one was heard in this incident. Now let's take a look at the virus trends. The U.S. has floated on a 53 to 55,000 seven-day case average for over a week. Deaths have fallen overall, but slowed in their descent recently. Monday ended with a seven-day average of about 1,000 deaths. In the United Kingdom, some are worried that the virus's death toll may be skewed. An organization, the COVID-19 Assembly, launched an investigation into the numbers. They say doctors have incorrectly attributed some deaths to the virus, because of the government's pandemic-related changes in policy. Here's the head of that project. COVID is a serious condition and the result of a novel virus that undoubtedly has caused many deaths. However, there is an increasing amount of evidence that at least some deaths have been misattributed. Taking a compassionate and methodical approach, 
we can achieve a thorough understanding of the issues and where there are lessons to be learned for the future. They say they'll rely on information from the public, hospitals and professionals to investigate the UK's over 100,000 COVID-related deaths. The full jury has been selected in the trial of former police officer Derek Chauvin. It consists of nine women and six men. It took 11 days of questioning by attorneys on both sides to select them. Twelve of the jurors will make the judgment and two are alternates. One will be dismissed if they all show up. Nine of the jurors are white and six are either black or of mixed race. USA Today reports that most of them have seen at least some of the footage of the arrest, but they said they would decide the case based only on the evidence in the court, not on their opinions. Chauvin is charged with second and third degree murder in the death of George Floyd. If convicted, he faces up to 15 years in prison. Evanston, Illinois is the first city in the country to offer reparations to African Americans. Officials in the Chicago suburbs say the program addresses the city's history of housing discrimination towards black residents. The Chicago Tribune reported on reparations. They say that historically Evanston limited the places in the city where blacks could legally live. Eligible individuals may receive awards of up to 25 grand. It could go towards paying for a house or other housing expenses. The funding comes from a marijuana sales tax and donations. Part of that money establishes a housing grant program to the tune of $400,000. To qualify, applicants must meet at least two requirements. One is that they must have an origin that traces back to any of the black racial ethnic groups of Africa. And the other is that they need to have been black residents of the city between 1919 and 1969 or a direct descendant of someone who was. U.S. Senator Dan Sullivan discussed his view on the China challenge and its vulnerabilities at the Atlantic Council on Monday. His remarks come after the U.S. and its allies announced sanctions on China over the Uyghur genocide. On Monday, the EU, the United States, Canada and Britain announced sanctions on China over the abuse of Uyghurs. U.S. Senator Dan Sullivan calls it a significant move. Real important development. And again, it's an area where the Chinese are very vulnerable and they know it. Last week, U.S. and Chinese officials had an open clash at the opening of their first face-to-face -face meeting in Anchorage, Alaska. Human rights and democracy are their key divisions. Sullivan, who has rich experience in dealing with China, sees these as the regime's key vulnerabilities and says it's appropriate to put pressure there. When you saw their leadership on live TV lecturing Americans, lecturing the world about their, quote, democracy, they don't have a democracy. We all know that. And human rights. Sullivan said that Chinese leaders will not be part of the world system that led to their rise and that they're putting forward an authoritarian system, not just at home, but also abroad. But I think it's its own Cold War. We need to recognize it. We need to prepare for it. And um, we need to work with our allies to deal with it. Sullivan believes that in dealing with this China challenge, America's strength is in how both parties are coming together over this. And the good news is Democrats and Republicans in the Congress have awakened to this. And I think there's an opportunity to really put together a strategy long term, bipartisan, like we did in 1947. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Senator Todd Young are working together on a bill aimed at boosting the U.S.'s economic competitiveness with China. It's anticipated to hit the Senate floor in late April. Reporting by Kitty Wang, NTD News. A coalition of human rights groups is urging Airbnb to drop its sponsorship for the International Olympic Committee. It's over the Beijing Winter Games next year and the Chinese regime's human rights abuses. Home sharing platform Airbnb is one of the 15 leading sponsors of the International Olympic Committee, or IOC. In an open letter to Airbnb CEO Brian Chesky, a coalition of over 190 human rights groups argues that Airbnb is trying to promote 
tourism in China at the expense of Uyghurs and Tibetans. It says Airbnb is glossing over communist China's horrifying human rights record. The communist regime has detained an estimated one million Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang region. Airbnb signed up to be a top sponsor for the IOC in late 2019. Human rights groups are also sending a similar message to other IOC sponsors. Some are calling for the boycott of the Beijing Winter Games. On the other hand, the IOC says it will not move the 2022 Winter Games out of communist China and that it will maintain what it calls political neutrality. Up next, casualties and missing person report after a massive fire in New York on Tuesday night. The blaze destroyed an assisted living facility there. And big name stores close their doors while shooting incidents surge in Chicago. They're threatening living conditions in the city. More on that in just a moment. An assisted living facility in New York State is not much more than rubble after a fire destroyed it. At least one person has died and one firefighter went missing while rescuing residents. First responders are still looking for him. NTD's Arian Pazdar has the story from Rockland County, New York. We are here in Spring Valley, Rockland County, New York, where a fire erupted at 1 a.m. on Tuesday. So far, one casualty has been reported. Unfortunately, one of the residents died. But around 25 others have been rescued and are safe, according to other reports. Now, as you can see here, there is still smoke coming out of the building and there's a number of firefighters on the scene still fighting the fire and trying to contain the blazes. I don't know if you can still see it right now, but around five minutes ago, ago flames could still be seen and there's a number of firefighters, as I said, still working hard to contain the fire, making sure everyone is safe and also that the buildings around them are safe. Rockland County has a big Orthodox Jewish community. Their emergency response team showed up at the scene. One member of their community explained how the firefighter went missing. At about 1.20, the firefighter gave a mayday call saying that he is with residents, but he is trapped and he can't move out. So he was in there saving other people's lives. He kept on bringing people to the door, handed off to Havera members, uh, but then he went back in and he apparently was engulfed in flames. While we were at the scene, the first responders were actively searching for the missing firefighter. They brought a K-9 team, including a dog, to look for him. One local resident said he heard a loud noise at around 4 a.m. that woke him up. Sleeping with my wife, I saw something, boom, I said, oh, wow. I tell my wife, go up, go up, what happened? The building can no longer be saved. Only a few remaining parts were still standing Tuesday afternoon. Arian Pastar, NTD News. New York firms are considering leaving the city over high taxes. At least 20 companies already plan on moving to Florida. NTD's Jam Jasmina Davis reports. Top New York firms are considering leaving the city over a possible tax hike. Many have already left, including Case Capital Advisors. It was absolutely driven by not only my new opportunity, but also driven by what I viewed uh, as uh, an insane tax structure in New York State and only getting worse. This is happening as politicians propose $7 billion in new state taxes. New York is already one of the most tax burdened states in the nation. We'd raised our children in New York, right? I'd spent 40 years there. I participated in the whole New York lifestyle. But then when, um, when uh, Trump was in office and they created, they passed that Tax Reform Act, you know, a lot of the big blue states uh, got whacked in terms of uh, uh, deductibility of very high taxes. One destination for many firms is Florida. Many want to move either part of their companies or their entire companies there, including Goldman Sachs and Hedge Fund Citadel and Elliott Management. Florida real estate firms seem pretty happy about this. It's one of the most tax-friendly states, and the tax benefits of Florida, I mean, they just go on and on and on. Florida residents don't pay a statewide income tax, only federal rates. 
New York's governor, on the other hand, wants to raise New York City's top rate to 14.7 percent, the highest in the nation on top of state taxes. I'm seeing a lot of executives in a lot of the companies that I'm, that I'm working with. A lot of them are moving there. Florida has an unbelievably high quality of life. It's like being on a vacation every single day. It's the weather is gorgeous. Even JetBlue, founded in New York back in the 1990s, is considering shifting a number of headquarter roles to Florida. JetBlue said in a memo to staff it'll have a final plan later this year. Jasmina Davis, NTD News. More than 250 New York business leaders have signed a letter to Governor Cuomo challenging the need for state tax increases. The leaders include heads of financial companies like J.P. Morgan Chase, Blackstone and big publisher Condé Nast. As more workers return to the office, dogs are seeing less of their owners. But one coffee shop in New York lets you grab your cup of joe with your dog. NTD's Sapphire Quarter has the story. It's National Puppy Day and people are celebrating with their pooches across New York City. Some of them are coming to Boris and Horton to get their dogs and themselves a treat. We're in New York's first Department of Health approved dog friendly coffee shop. You can bring your dog, take them off the leash and let them have some fun while you enjoy your drink. Double doors keep them from escaping. We like to think we're a, the happiest place in New York. One customer says it's her and her dog's favorite place. I haven't gone to any restaurants, even though indoor dining, outdoor dining is open, but this is the one place I have been consistently coming to pretty much every weekend. She thinks she might start coming every day. Starting on National Puppy Day, after nearly a year of limited hours, Boris and Horton will open seven days a week. I have to have at least one coffee every day, and it's really nice to come here, be able to have my dog off the leash, he can socialize, have a good time. It's not only the dogs that come here for some canine companionship. I've never had a dog, but I really like them. Petting a dog during stressful times can be therapeutic. After class or during midterm, sometimes it's a great way to relax and also socialize um, with people and the doggos. The co-owner says the pooch's favorite part may be the snacks. So we have dog donuts, dog ice cream, dog cupcakes. We asked the dogs what they think of this place. Well, he's not telling us what he thinks, but based on his reaction from having the treat, we assume he likes it here. Sapphire Quarter, NTD News, New York. It looks like humans aren't the only ones enjoying the nice weather in New York City. In a rare sighting, three dolphins were spotted in the city's East River near Brooklyn. It's an unforgettable sight to see playful dolphins swimming along the river. One bystander took a video of the incident. You can see them swimming with the new New York skyline and the clear blue sky in the background. Dolphins aren't usually spotted in this area, which makes this sighting so special. And coming up, a convention center in California is turning into a shelter for illegal immigrant children with, to cope with a border surge. And violent attacks seem to be on the rise. One Californian is urging lawmakers to protect the victims. That and more on NTD News. Ninety percent of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The mission of the Epic Times is to chase the truth, to ground all statements and facts, and prevent people from being misled. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit. Subscribe today and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. We'd love to have you on board. When you look at TV networks in America, a soundbite and fight it out culture prevails on news and commentary programs. As a Canadian, I'm fascinated with America, and I wanted to offer American thought leaders an opportunity to share their thoughts in a deep dive format where we can explore their ideas together. And so American Thought Leaders was born. The world's most brilliant thinkers believed that open discourse was the key to greatness. However, all around the world, we see that discourse is being stifled and political agendas have subverted media. The Epoch Times launched its Global Thought Leaders program 
to bring back this great tradition of free thought. As the host of American Thought Leaders, every week I interview some of the most intriguing minds on the most pressing issues of our time. Be sure to check out our new episodes every week. The federal government is converting a convention center in California into a shelter for illegal immigrant children amid a border surge that has shown no sign of slowing down. NTD's Eileen Eng has the details. The Biden administration requested help from the city of San Diego to use a convention center as an immigration shelter. This comes after a surge in unaccompanied minors who have been crossing into the U.S. from Mexico. The officials agreed over the weekend to operate the San Diego Convention Center as a temporary shelter. A joint statement from the San Diego Mayor and Board of Supervisors says they will work together to provide the children with a safe space before they're reunited with their families. Minors will be provided with food, medical care, a place to sleep, and showers. There's no details as to how many children would be held, when they would start arriving, or which part of the border they would be coming from. City officials said the site can be used for as long as three months, with each minor staying there around 30 days. The children will be as old as 17. The announcement follows leaked photos from a migrant holding facility in Texas, more evidence of the surge of minors, and the efforts to manage the influx. Eileen Eng, NTD News, California. In light of recent attacks on California residents, one man is condemning the violence. He says California law should focus on protecting victims. NTD's David Lamb has the details. Being pushed on the streets, ambushed in a laundromat, or hearing offensive terms, these seem to be common nowadays near Asian districts. Originally from Taiwan, Peter Kuo says he came to the U.S. in 1982 and that racism then is different from what it is now. The real racism is when you see a person and you automatically assume that's why they are. Kuo says the recent attacks stem from Asian hate crime and the stigma that people are vulnerable victims is what's causing today's violence. In one incident, a victim says he was pushed and then lost consciousness. He woke up with bruised eyes and nearly blinded. Kuo feels that the Asian community is being targeted, but he urges people to condemn violence against any particular groups. It could be against African American, could be against Asian, Latinos, or even whites. Those type of hate needs to be stopped right now. He also referenced Senate Bill 82, which may classify certain robberies as misdemeanors, not felonies. He says this would tolerate criminal mentality, allowing people who break the law to get away. If you rob a person without a gun, that's considered a misdemeanor. And I thought uh, that is just utter craziness. Where Robberies without the use of a deadly weapon or serious injuries would be labeled as petty theft. Quo believes this is only a slap on the wrist. It drives me crazy to even think that our legislator can ignore this, this uh, problem that we're having today. It's because there's no consequences of their crime. He urges lawmakers to create laws that deter crimes and create an environment where violators will be punished. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Quality of living seems to be falling in Chicago. Several retailers like Macy's closed their doors and shootings remain high. NTD's Don Tran has the details. While some parts of the U.S. recover from the virus pandemic, others are still feeling its impacts. The Magnificent Mile, Chicago's premier shopping district, lost quite a few retail stores. Macy's, which did business in the Mag Mile for 45 years, closed. Other names like Gap and Express also closed their locations. Some people visiting the shopping district are worried and disappointed. I worry about the people that are employed with the stores and... Um, yeah, I do. I worry about all the monopolies, Amazon taking over, and because I like the smaller businesses and 
it seems like those are the ones that are impacted. I'm a writer, so I was really hoping to see the museum, the Writers Museum, and that is closed, and several other attractions are closed. I'm actually going to the 360 building, so that's the only thing I could book. Others said they aren't that concerned about the closures. I mean, look at the, you know, it's still vibrant. There's still people on the streets. I would like to see uh, the Magnificent Mile more uh, of a draw for locals, though, be, instead of shopping, more, you know, restaurants that my locals might like. But it's not just reduced business activity people in Chicago have to deal with. Citywide gun violence is continuing to soar. Shooting incidents reported in February were the highest they've been for the month in the last four years, according to the Chicago Police Department. One resident said the city should focus more on handling the gun violence. Especially for the little kids that are getting uh, shot. Some residents also said there have been more homeless people in the streets. They hope for the day that things go back to the way they were. Don Tran, NTD News. Coming up, the Chinese military is banning Tesla cars to protect itself against espionage concerns. Meanwhile, India is warning against cyber attacks from the Chinese regime. The Chinese military has reportedly banned cars from Tesla. That's over concerns that their car cameras could be used for spying. And India is sounding the alarm over unconventional warfare coming from communist China. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more on that. Tesla cars are famously high-tech, but spy cams aren't among their known features. Even so, the Chinese regime is banning the cars from military housing complexes. Reuters sources say Chinese officials are concerned that cameras in the cars could be used for espionage. And owners were reportedly told to park outside military property. The Wall Street Journal reports Chinese officials found the vehicles could record images of their surroundings. Now, more than a few car owners could be affected. Tesla sold over 18,000 Chinese-made vehicles just last month. This year, Tesla has been through a series of setbacks in China. Five Chinese regulators summoned Tesla over quality issues in February. Chinese media also ramped up coverage of consumer complaints. And the company is recalling over 30,000 vehicles that have quality issues. India is warning against unconventional warfare tactics. That's after it suffered a severe power grid shutdown last October, something it's since blamed on Chinese hackers backed by the state. Mumbai is India's second largest city and its financial capital. But last autumn, it was plunged into darkness, enduring its worst blackout in decades. Thousands of businesses shut down, trains were suspended, millions left without power. It later turned out India may have the Chinese regime to thank for it. Indian officials pointed to state-backed Chinese hackers for causing the power failure. The blackout happened while China and India were fighting over borders in the Himalayas. Both sides suffered soldier casualties. A U.S. research firm suggests the two incidents could have been connected and that China was sending a message to Indian officials back down on border claims. Now, India is looking to raise the issue on the global stage. Local media reports citing officials say the country may soon take the Chinese hacking case to international committees. The Mumbai blackout is the latest example of the Chinese regime's unconventional warfare. Without opening fire or sending in troops, the Communist Party can use cyber attacks to paralyze a city and use it as political leverage. India has learned that lesson the hard way. And now experts are calling on the Indian government to cut down on China-made hardware, both for the country's power grids and its critical rail system. American experts are raising similar concerns. The U.S. currently relies on at least 200 power transformers made in China. The hardware is essential for delivering electricity to homes and businesses. Back in 2018, one Chinese company claimed that their gear supported 10 percent of New York City's power grid. But last year, U.S. authorities seized the company's products, citing national security investigations. China-made transformers were also previously found to include extra electronics that shouldn't have been there. The Trump administration issued a related executive order last May. It aimed to reduce dependence on China for equipment used in the U.S. power grid. President Biden suspended that order on Inauguration Day. It remains to be seen whether he will reinstate it or not. 
An increasing number of Chinese people are waking up to the threat of the Chinese Communist regime. One of them is entrepreneur Ding Haijiang. But what made him change his mind? NTD's Becky Jo has more. Ding Haijiang is a Chinese entrepreneur based in New Zealand. He's urging more people to quit the Chinese Communist Party and helped spread awareness about the movement at a New Zealand rally. He shared his story with us and explained his motivation. Ding says he used to believe everything the Chinese regime had to say until he lost over $100,000. When he filed a complaint with the authorities hoping to recoup the loss, handcuffs were all they offered him. I started to see the true picture of the Communist Party. Its lies won't work if you question it. He had invested in the Chinese stock market back in 2007 after his company found some success. But his fortune was short-lived. The stock index crashed in Shanghai after reaching a record high that same year. Beijing claimed double-digit economic growth despite the hardships brought on by the global financial crisis. Because China didn't own up to its financial losses, he kept his money in the stock market. He says back then he trusted Chinese authorities. By the end of 2009, I had lost over $40,000, so I questioned what the CCP said. A few years later, the regime and Chinese state-run media encouraged people to invest in a new company. Its online platform allowed people to borrow money directly from their peers. Ding invested in the company, hoping to recover his losses from the stock market. But he says he realized later that both the regime and its media were lying. The Chinese police soon arrested many members of the company for running a Ponzi scheme, a form of fraud that pays early investors using funds from newer investors. Nearly one million investors lost money in the scheme, including Ding. He and other victims traveled to Beijing to file complaints and petition authorities for justice in 2016. Local police arrested some of them. When the number of petitioners reached 50, the police swarmed and pulled them into a van to send them to a black jail. Some petitioners held on to a nearby fence when police tried to arrest them. Ding says he saw police officers assault and stab at least one petitioner who was left wounded and bleeding. Ding says the chain of events opened his eyes. He and his family later immigrated to New Zealand. He's one of over 300 million Chinese people that have abandoned their ties to the Chinese Communist Party and its affiliated organizations. He renounced his Communist Party membership with help from U.S.-based website Tweedong, which operates global service centers to help people quit. Ding says he hopes more Chinese people will abandon the Communist Party. Reporting by Becky Zhou, NTD News. Over to Europe. New rules set to come into force next week mean anyone in England trying to go abroad on holiday risks a $7,000 fine. But protests outdoors will be allowed again. Here's NTD's Jane Whirl with the details. As England continues on its roadmap out of lockdown, MPs will vote on a raft of new measures later this week. Among those measures is a hefty fine of £5,000 for going abroad without a reasonable excuse. While current rules mean we aren't allowed to go on holiday abroad, this £5,000 fine is a new measure. If passed, it will come into force from the 29th of March. The regulations say there's a need for the rules to be reviewed by the 12th of April and every 35 days after that. The laws expire on the 30th of June, unless they're scrapped beforehand. Some Conservative MPs say they'll vote against it, but it's expected to pass in the Commons this week. Under the government's roadmap out of lockdown, May 17th is the earliest date to travel abroad without a reasonable excuse. The health secretary stresses that the final decision of the state is yet to be made. It is now too early to know how, where that, the Global Travel Task Force will come out and know what the decision will be for the 17th of May. And the reason for that is that we are seeing this third wave rising in some parts of Europe, and we're also seeing uh, new variants. England will move into its next stage out of lockdown on Monday, when people will be allowed to meet outdoors in groups of six or two household bubbles can meet. Also in the rules is the addition of protests as an exemption in the ban on mass gatherings as long as required precautions are taken. It follows pressure from campaigners and MPs to make the rules around protests clearer. The vote on the regulations will happen in Parliament on Thursday. Jane Wirral, NTD News, London. 
British Airways and other airlines worry that European countries could be added to a red list. So they're canceling summer holiday flights to Europe. NTD's Patrick Hayden has the story. UK airlines are axing summer flights to Europe. British Airways has already cancelled flights over June and July, according to The Telegraph. The airlines fear that once UK travel restrictions could be eased on the 17th of May, there will only be a small number of EU countries that will be on a green list. Health Minister Lord Bethel told the Lords CCP virus rates in Europe were surging around 10%, linked in part to new variants. And that could mean drastic measures are needed. Defence Secretary Ben Wallace has also refused to rule out an extension on the travel ban. Patrick Hayden, NTD News, London. The government has revealed details of what it says is the biggest shake-up to the British military since the Cold War. It means fewer tanks, more robotic ships and a new role for the Royal Marines. More robots in the sky but fewer boots on the ground. That's part of the government's ambitious military refit. The armed forces working with the rest of government must think and act differently. They will no longer be held as a force of last resort but become a more present and active force around the world. The budget is up by 14% over the coming four years, but troop numbers will drop to record lows. The Army's increased deployability and technological advantage will mean that greater effect can be delivered by fewer people. I have therefore taken the decision to reduce the size of the Army from today's current strength of 76,500 trade-trained personnel to 72,500 by 2025. The government described the official defence review as the biggest shake-up since the Cold War. It marks a shift from mass mobilisation to information age speed, readiness and relevance for confronting the threats of the future. It's part of a broader review of foreign policy. The government is pumping money into developing military space and cyber capabilities along with unmanned aerial systems. But the new plans will also reduce tanks. And logistical war horses like the Hercules transport aircraft will be retired early. That raised concerns among some military analysts. If historically, uh, the British Army had 1,200 main battle tanks uh, at the start of the First Gulf War, 1990. It's now going to be reduced from a current fleet of 227 to just 148. So that's enough for two armoured regiments, um, which is almost... It's not even a token. It's not even a token amount. It's not even a token force. There is very little you can do with two armoured regiments in the grand Ooh. scheme of things. Meanwhile, the Royal Marines are becoming SAS-style special operations forces, the future commando force. They will be joined by another special ops regiment, the Rangers. So it's this much more um, light footprint, expeditionary in nature um, deployment uh, capability. Um, the, uh, the Marines will have going forwards. The MOD wants them to tackle what is called grey zone competition. That means hustling for advantage with the likes of China and Russia without firing a shot. The notion of war and peace as binary states have given way to a continuum of conflict, requiring us to prepare our forces for more persistent global engagement and constant campaigning. That grey area between war and competition includes information warfare, such as online disinformation campaigns launched by China and Russia. With the, uh, the special forces uh, almost leading on this in collaboration with both MI6 and GCHQ, you're, you're blending traditional capabilities um, and non-conventional uh, capabilities with the intelligence and the, the cyberspace. Um, so it's very interesting. Um, going forwards, absolutely. The Navy too is being refitted to face threats of a digital age. 13 minesweepers will be replaced with a fleet of robots. And a new spy ship will be built to protect the underseas cables that keep the nation hooked up to the internet. Coming up, archaeologists in Greece find an over 2,500-year-old bronze statue of a bull completely intact. It may have been an offering to Zeus. And an unusual pet is rescued from a flood in Australia. Though the mission gave new meaning to the term wild goose chase for the owner. That and more on NTD News.
Learning how to surf can be daunting, but in California, one instructor is using an animal friend to help. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. California surfer Dana McGregor has always been stoked to catch a wave, but he says it was even more rad when he took his pet goat along for the ride one day. I, I feel honestly called uh, at, like to bring joy to people and to people's lives, and for some reason I got goats, and, and for some reason I took up surfing, and for some reason I have a love for working with kids, and it all works together, you know, really well. McGregor spends his time teaching children how to surf and his goats help them overcome their fears of the water. The goats seem to enjoy it too. I think the kids see it and they're like, wow, that's incredible, like, I can surf, you know, and, and, and it kind of takes away the fear, you know, of the ocean and the waves and the power behind it, you know, so I think it brings a lot of freedom to people. McGregor's eight-year-old goat, Pismo, appeared relaxed as he hit the waves on a large inflatable surfboard. Fresh from the surf, 10-year-old Malia Robbins was ecstatic. It's really like fun because you get really watery, but first when it's your first time it feels scary, but actually after you keep on doing it and doing it, it's really fun. McGregor runs surf and soccer camps out of Pismo Beach, north of Santa Barbara. That's where he incorporates his pet goats, Pismo and Grover, into his lessons. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. After heavy rainfall, archaeologists discover an over 2,000-year-old statue of a bronze bull. Peeking out of the earth, a bronze bull idol at an excavation site in Olympia. Greek archaeologists carefully remove the dirt, revealing the whole statue is intact, a rare find. The idol was transferred to a laboratory for conservation. It's more than 2,500 years old and was found buried close to the temple for Zeus at Olympia. The site is the birthplace of the Olympic Games. In a statement, the culture ministry says it was found in one of the most celebrated sanctuaries in ancient Greece. Archaeologists believe this may have been a gift to Zeus. Bulls and horses were frequently offered as gifts because of their prominent role in Greek life. A pet was rescued from floodwaters in Australia. Bringing it to safety was a bit of a struggle because it wasn't your everyday house cat or dog. In Sydney, Australia, someone's feathery pet was seen lost in a flood. The bird's name is Gookie, and turns out it's an emu. I thought it was a swan, and it ended up being an emu. So I called you guys in the boat to rescue the emu. Paul Zamet, Gookie's owner, jumped in a boat to rescue it. They cornered it on the edge of the flood water before bringing the blindfolded bird back to his property. Two other men in the same suburb used kayaks to bring eight chickens to safety as well. Some of the neighbors said Gookie is pretty dear to Paul. It's like a puppy to him, so, yeah. and he's just got an emu or two. The National Weather Agency posted weather warnings in every mainland state or territory but one, affecting around 10 million people in the country of 25 million. No deaths were reported, but thousands of people have been rescued by emergency services in recent days. Authorities ordered about 22,000 people to be ready to flee their homes. They could be joining over 18,000 people who have already been evacuated. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox.
Don't miss out on important news. Our videos are being deleted. So if you don't want to be cut off from honest news, take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD. Go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter.